our first speaker, Dr. R. Kim, to speak on technology in the retina. Thank you. Good morning and thank you, sir, uh, for the introduction and uh, the importance of telemedicine, especially in a country like India. Uh, well, I'm not sticking on this. My topic is technology in retinal disease management. Actually, I had only AI in my mind when I said this, but I didn't realize there would be multiple AI talks uh, and it could be a repetition of uh, the other talks too. So I do not have any financial disclosures. Uh, today as a retina person, we all understand that technology plays a major role in the diagnosis and management of retinal diseases in compared to all other specialties in eye care. I have very often seen that when I see a patient who was come with the fundus photo taken, uh, OCT taken, and uh, you hardly have anything to see because today all the ultra-wide field is giving you a much better view of the fundus, and uh, the OCT is there for you to see. So even if you're going to look at the macular edema, you're going to see a two-dimensional picture, but not the whole structure which the OCT would give. So your... your uh, decision on the management is made just based on looking at these technology devices outcomes. That, uh, as I said, the retina is the most difficult area to visualize in the eye, the, for which the indirect ophthalmoscopy was born, and then up came the fundus camera, and then the series of imaging devices. Today we have uh, any number of those, starting from a simple non-metriatic fundus cameras to the ultra-wide field imaging devices like optos. In management, we have lasers, multitude of lasers, and uh, we have different lasers that have come uh, in, the, in the market for us to use. Imaging, as I mentioned, earlier the fundus cameras were expensive, uh, prohibitive to buy, but today you get them as cheap as two lakhs to anywhere uh, above that. So it is affordable for every ophthalmologist to buy these fundus cameras. Uh, so, and with all the increase in the prevalence of diabetes and diabetic retinopathy, the need for using these fundus cameras becomes all the more important. Of course, ultra-wide field cameras are still prohibitive to buy because of the cost that is there. But again, it's a matter of time when you would, when they would become very easy for any ophthalmologist, general ophthalmologist to even afford this OCT and OCTA has made a huge change. How OCT made a change in the way we see retina, I think the OCTA also is making the change in how we are perceiving or looking at the retinal diseases. Surgery, the most expensive and complicated microscopes are being used by the retinal uh, surgeons for the need to look into the back of the eye with the 3Ds and the ingenuity and the RTOs which helps you to just not look through the microscope, just look at a TV screen and operate have made your life easier, especially for the back problem that many of the retinal surgeons are known for. So today we have microscopes uh, fitted, integrated with OCT, so as you operate, you know which layer of the retinal membrane that you're peeling, and this helps in many ways in, in precision in the way, in, because you're today operating on patients who have 6966 six, six vision uh, in the retinal area because of the epiretinal membrane or many other uh, pathologies that are there. So today those are all possible because of the technology, uh, the advanced instruments that we have in hand in, in, in being able to touch these. One of the important thing that has come in the recent times is the introduction of uh, artificial intelligence, the most noteworthy development in ophthalmology over the last decade. It has made uh, the, the, it is making a lot of changes in the way we are going to manage the retinal diseases. It started with the diagnosis, I mean diabetic retinopathy screening. Sir mentioned about those remote areas where patients do not have access to care are these places where we can do the diabetic retinopathy screening, what we call as telescreening, using simple fundus cameras. We have been doing this for the last 20 years uh, in different diabetic clinics, putting the fundus cameras, asking that of technologists, 
technicians in those clinics to use these fundus cameras, just take pictures and send it to us where our retina specialists would read these images, grade and send a report back in an hour or two hours time. So that only those patients who have any retinopathy are referred to the ophthalmologist, which is like 20% of there at any given time and 80% they can be asked to visit uh, after one year. But there are challenges in this whole process because one, the availability of the retina specialist time for grading these images is a, is a monotonous work. They are better uh, in, in used in uh, diagnosing and retinal diseases or managing the retinal diseases than sitting in front of the uh, system and grading these images. But more importantly, there's a lot of inconsistency in the way different people grade these images. So how do we address that? I think AI algorithm came in at the right time. And uh, myself and Dr. Rajiv Raman here, both of us had worked with the Google team to develop an algorithm using multiple images. These algorithms were trained to diagnose and grade the diabetic retinopathy at different stages. And today we are able to do that uh, in real time. And uh, we have done, both of us have done multiple validation studies to see if this AI algorithms are working fine. And we found that it is better or even uh, comparable to the retina specialist, leave alone the general ophthalmologist as the grader, uh, it is doing a much better job in identifying even the finest, earliest uh, mild diabetic retinopathy, which very often many of us may miss to see. So things I can do but are not a good use of time is what AI can replace us with easily and works consistently. But there's also other things that AI can do that is find new signals which human eyes cannot see. As I mentioned, today we are using this for the last three, four years in real time after it, these algorithms got approved. And we have screened till date about close to 700,000 eyes uh, for diabetic retinopathy. So what we have done in this whole process is just replace the grader with a AI tool and the, with a turnaround time of one minute. And this is available 24 by seven uh, to the diabetologist, so they don't need to depend on us for grading or, or screening this, which is a big value addition for the diabetic patients because they are there for the diabetic, diabetic screening. And at the same time, they're getting their eyes screened or the retinopathy screened, which is only those who really need need to be go to the ophthalmologist even if their vision is good. But very often, patients do not come because they say their vision is good and their sugar is under good control, they think they can get away with it. But little do they realize, once they see their images that they have hemorrhages in the eye, then they are a little bit convinced that they need to do something about it. So I just wanted to look at this data that we had. Uh, I was looking at the data before we introduced AI in our screening program. We screened about 200,000 patients in one year, that is 2018 and our DR diagnosis was around 1,090 patients. Whereas in 2022, when it was fully integrated with the AI, the number increased tremendously. Whether we were missing out or uh, we don't know, we are trying to understand what are the reasons that we were, this number went up eight times to identify those diabetic retinopathies, uh, which we didn't do scre while screening earlier on. So there is definitely an AI which is doing a lot of progressive uh, activity that it is, it's, it's uh, showing that we can do much better, but still there's a long way to go. Detecting diabetic macular edema with just using fundus photos, uh, looking at the, uh, at the uh, fundus photos, can you say whether the patient has got macular edema without doing OCT. Looks like it is possible with the AI, but this is work in progress. Again, um, Rajiv's team has done a tremendous work in trying to predict whether uh, these patients can, uh, those who develop diabetic retinopathy, those who, if you want to inject anti-VEGFs, whether those patients would respond to treatment. How good it will be to know that if you're going to give the injection to this patient, and you knew ahead of time there is a the fair chance that this patient will respond to the anti vegf then you can you are justified in going ahead and giving the treatment but today we are blindly doing it hoping that it would work in most of the patients 
This is another interesting factor that uh, what AI can do, predicting the risk of developing diabetic retinopathy. A patient who does not have any retinopathy, but a diabetic patient who is, has no retinopathy, you take their fundus photo and subject this to the algorithm, and the algorithm is able to predict what are the chances that this patient is likely to develop diabetic retinopathy in the next five years. So if you can identify those high-risk patients, then you can follow them more closely, ensure that they have a good diabetic control, rather than the other patients who were less likely to develop diabetic retinopathy. Again, this is a work in progress and needs uh, to be evaluated. So I, I'm sorry I missed, I overshot the time. So AI can play a major role. We know that it can predict the sex, uh, gender of the patient cardiovascular risk factors of the patient. What we are now working on is using just the straight, simple fundus, I mean your mobile phone, taking a photo of the eye, it is able to predict multiple systemic biomarkers. This was, predict, uh, this was published last year, especially kidney function. Take an eye photo and you are finding the function of the kidney, uh, EGFR, hemoglobin, and all these levels can come just out of your fundus photos. Again, this is a work in progress. This is another, the, the software that I saw uh, based out of Canada, they say the tagline is take a selfie and know you're healthy. Just take a picture of your face and I believe it is able to predict all these parameters it is able to give. And this is approved and waiting for FDA approval now, but it's approved in many other countries. So they're far ahead in using AI uh, in, in these space, so no need for blood tests or many of those investigations looks like, at least as a screening tool. Home monitoring tools have come in using AI, and we are trying to see if we can develop AI tools that we can use in the rural areas that Dr. Subudi was pointing out. Can we just use a non-skilled person to triage the patients in the villages to identify those high-risk patients using these AI tools and sending them into the uh, uh, sending only those who have high risk to the I mean, to the ophthalmologist for further management. So there's a lot of act work happening in AI, as they said. I is the window to your body, which means the retina will certainly become the place for every specialist to look at and predict what the systemic disease is likely. So thank you, thank you, sir, for your for the opportunity. So. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Kim sir, for the excellent talk. Uh, all of us know that uh, Dr. Kim sir is one of the pioneers in the field of uh, technology and eye and especially artificial intelligence and has been acknowledged in different forums, uh, including Mr. Sundar Pichai and their work uh, with the Google, what sir was mentioning. In 2016, the JAMA ophthalmology paper has been cited more than 2,500 or 3,000 times. Rajiv sir also agree. So all of us, we are very uh, privileged, and especially me, because sir has uh, mentored me, uh, starting from my <laughs> fellowship with the ABCD of retina, he has taught me. So thank you very much, sir. Very uh, uh, ex excellent talk, sir. So.